Hello, everybody. This is Joshua Hatton with One Nation Under Whiskey Podcast. I'm joined today, and I'm joined as always by my good friend, uh, the man with white hair, glasses, and a ca- and a Catoctin <laughs> Creek T-shirt on him <laughs> at all times. Somebody bit off more than he could chew on that one. I know. I tried to say Catoctin Creek. Say oh, that that's why you tried fast. to say it. Catoctin Creek, yeah. Catoctin Creek, Catoctin. Oh, that's not so bad. Glad we could have this conversation. Anyway, Jason Johnston Yellen is your name. <laughs> <laughs> you are correct. It is. Hello. Hello to you. Yeah. Dear Joshua. And yeah. dear listeners. And hello to yourself. We have a slightly different episode today in that... We we purposely chose to not invite anyone <laughs> to this episode. We said, you know what? Screw it. This is our episode. It's our time. Our parents, they want the best of stuff for us. But right now they got to do what's right for them. Because it's their time. Their time. Up there. Down here, it's our time. It's our time down here. That's all over the second we ride up Troy's bucket. Well, I think to be perfectly honest, I, I think we begrudgingly invite people on to each episode, <laughs> right? I, I think if you listen to our intros, and I know that many of our listeners do, there are times we just take 30 minutes of just catching up with one another before we get to the interview. And so... You know, and sometimes we're like, all right, well, I suppose we'll end this where we are and welcome in such and such a person to whom we spoke. Uh So, no, that's none of that is true. We absolutely love our interviewees, those who really commit their time to us. Mm. And and oftentimes we'll we'll sit and talk for 90 minutes and, and only... 65 minutes will make it into the final edit. That's very true. (laughs) You know, (laughs) speaking of that, and and normally this would be something that I would bring up uh, toward the end of our podcast, you know, when we... Today there are no rules. There are no rules, right? Rules are out the window. So normally we will bring in listener mail toward the end of an episode, but, but I think you really set up... Uh, you set things up perfectly for an email we got from from a dear friend, James Foster. Yes, indeed. Very, very dear friend. And, and this was a tough one for me because I, despite popular belief, I have a real tough time with compliments. I don't know how to receive them. I don't know how to respond to them. And as much as I really enjoy them, I don't know what to do with them once I have them. And 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 so James sent us each. Or, or I hope at least one of our listeners is believing you here. I hope at least one. There's got to be one gullible listener. One. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got two gullible hosts, so we should have at least one gullible listener. So we got this email from... James, that they really touched me, and and I read it to Haida last night, and she said, "Wow, that's that's pretty special." And I know you hadn't read this yet. I have so not. I figured. When I'd did share. it come in? What's that? When did it come in? It came in on the Wednesday. Yeah. Okay, the twentieth of uh, July. Sure. Yeah. If today's the twenty second, it came in on the twentieth. <laughs> it came in on the Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> You know, there's only one of those a year. It just came in one, on that day. Right? Just the one Wednesday. <laughs> it's like the one the okay. one day of summer in Scotland. This is what? Are July you, 20th? I literally just texted that to my mother this morning. <laughs> Did you? Like, <laughs> yep. Hope you enjoyed your one day of Scottish summer. It was a scorcher. <laughs> it reached 75 in Ayrshire. 75. What's that in, cel- I almost said cellulose, in Celsius. Is that what, 18 degrees? 19 something degrees? like that, yeah. I, like I looked that. I looked it up and, and now I, I forget. Wait, but seven, yeah, something like that. 75 Fahrenheit is a scorcher for air? Oh, yeah. That was burny. Scorchio. <laughs> Scorchio, that's right. Um, 
Wow, there was some episode where we were talking about Scorchio. That's probably five <laughs> years ago now. Anyway, so uh, the the email from James Foster is is simply titled "Interviewees." Hmm. And James says, "I'm listening to the Black Button episode, and during the lead-in, you wax poetic about how wonderful your interviewees so often turn out to be. You've done that before, too." <laughs> 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 it's always funny. You just said this about Seabass uh, when you had the pleasure of meeting him the other night. But yeah. there are many, many people who listen to our our podcast who know it better than we do. And it's so interesting. <laughs> like, here's Foster, like, seeing a distinct pattern that we're just, that we're totally we just sit here recording. To. Yeah, we're, we're just monkeys with typewriters. <laughs> That's all we are. So. Yeah, I want I want to share a little bit of my my time with Seabass. That was a really a really nice meetup, a much needed one too. Nice. But let me continue here. So his email goes on and he says, "Guys, give yourself the credit you deserve." Yes, I get the impression that the people you interview are wonderful, interesting, exciting, <laughs> dot dot dot. But any great interview also requires a great interviewer or in this case, two. The One Nation episodes feel like we're sitting around a fireplace with you just having a good time because that's how you roll. Because was in all caps. Mm. I assure you, lesser interviewers could have interviewed the same interviewees and sucked. Credit where credit is due. Kudos, 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 James. Well, there you go. There you go. Yeah. That's delightful. That's Be really delightful. nice, right? That's, uh, that puts a little wind in my sails, as it were. <laughs> I, I could hear that wind in your sails, unfortunately. It's the wind coming out the sails that you don't want to hear or smell. <laughs> Always the sails, never the keel. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know what that means. <laughs> I don't know what that means either. Don't know what, don't There's know not a single means. listener who knows what you just said. <laughs> Well, you know the expression, better the chimney than the basement, for when you belch over when you fart? Ah, and so I was yeah, thinking yeah. sales over keel. But I was, it was tortured, and I tried to do it on the fly. Yeah. And here we are. Yeah. Don't Here's go, what it looks like. Yeah, don't, go, don't go further. But, uh, but yeah, <laughs> it, you know. <laughs> don't go further. <laughs> so you and I uh, said no guests this time around, no interviewees, and, and it would be a, a catch-up episode between – yeah, can, can I put some can I put some leaves on those branches? Yeah, please. It's it's been an interesting July where on one hand I feel like the industry is taking a well-deserved afternoon nap. Mm-hmm. You ever had one of those Sundays where you've just been busy busy busy, you've put in a good morning, maybe you've been with the kids, maybe you've been in the garden. In about two or three o'clock in the afternoon, you go into your into your bedroom to uh, change your shoes or mm-hmm. change your pants, by which I mean trousers for everyone who's outside the United States. <laughs> and and you just catch your bed out the corner of your eye and you think, you know, I could take 60 mm-hmm. minutes there. I think that could be A-OK. And I, I feel like where we are in this year, and we've said it many times on the podcast, this has been a very difficult year for everybody we know across the industry. Yeah. And we most definitely include ourselves in that. Oh, yeah. It's just been a lot all the time. On one hand, we're insanely busy all the time, and that's a fantastic thing. Yeah. But we're also trying to secure glass, and we're trying to get shipments moved, and we're trying to get labels printed, and... The logistics side is very, very difficult mm. right now. Mm. And and it's been interesting because I've seen my inbox slow down a little bit. And, and even people in Scotland who I've been hearing from pretty regularly yeah. have gone a little bit quiet as well. And, and the thought of just taking this little episode towards the tail end of July and just kind of tying a bow... On the first seven months, as we look forward to the next few months, which OND, October, November, December, will be here before we know it. And I think, you know, I've I've said on the podcast before, but our end of year review episode is always one of my favorites. Oh, yes. Because we just get to, 
right? We get to sit back, we get to talk to each other, we talk whiskey, we talk about the year that was, we talk about our listeners and our nation members and talk about Jess and Elijah. And it's just, it's a wonderful moment to reflect. And so the thought of you and I getting to do that here towards the end of July, it's like an afternoon Sunday nap to me. Mm. Yeah, you know, on those days where that does happen, um, I, I'm not just changing my trousers, but I'm also changing my pants. <laughs> pants squared. <right? laughs> pants squared, especially on a, on a hot July day. I mean, come on. <laughs> let's, let's, let's be honest here. If you're, if you're not going through two pairs of pants a day, like you're, you've got better air conditioning than I have. So it's interesting that you say your inbox slows down in July. Now, mm-hmm. now, granted, aspects of my inbox slow down, whereas other aspects kind of ramp up. You know, it's a lot of what I'm doing on the, on the whiskey work side of things normally in in non-summer months is you're working on things that are somewhat immediate Mm -hmm. whereas right now where everything feels immediate all the time immediate all the time right and and now it's okay we're having discussions on what to be doing in september in october Mm -hmm. in november Mm -hmm. and so you know there was at least for me a period of time where i would look forward to the slightly slower June, July, August. But it doesn't feel that slow for me. I still feel incredibly crunched. And, and mm. I'll tell you, be, because this is a catch-up episode, there was something, <laughs> even though I was still working the whole time, there was something so very special about being up in Montreal with my family uh, over the 4th of July holiday. Because, yes, I was working and I was planning Mm -hmm. and I was doing things, but there was something so nice about just doing it elsewhere. Sure. Yeah. (laughs) You know, we've talked so much about the travel we did pre-COVID and then the travel we didn't do post-COVID. And now the reality, and our, our listeners, many of our listeners will know this as well as we do, the current state of travel is not good. And so we certainly have not returned to pre-pandemic levels of travel. Mm -mm. And so we're still doing a lot of work from home. It's the in-office work that we've been doing since March of 2020. Mm -hmm. And here we are, summer of 2022. And so I have no doubt that getting out of country, getting away with your family will give you a very different look on what's been going on for the the vast majority of the last two and a half bloody years. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Is the correct response. <laughs> yeah, you know, it was it, it it's interesting and and I wonder if any of our listeners sort of feel the same, especially and specifically those that that now have made working from home their their primary thing, right? Mm-hmm. Where it seems as if you wake up, <laughs> you brush your teeth, you take your you 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 maybe make a little breakfast and you bring that up to your workspace <laughs> and you just start your day working. Like there there's there's a, a really nice freedom to being able to work from home. Right. Yep. No doubt but about at it. The no same doubt about it. Time, it's a but at dangerous the same time. proposition. Yeah. Yep. I because literally there's no separation, right? Yeah. I literally cross the landing from my bedroom to my office. <laughs> That's my my commute is two and a half steps. <laughs> <laughs> You don't drink and walk, do you? I hope not. I don't. I don't. I certainly don't chew bubble gum and walk at the same time. That is, <laughs> that's a bridge too far. But but and again, right? Hashtag first world problems. Yeah. In yep. some instances, it's absolutely amazing. It's absolutely wonderful. Mm-hmm. Right? I can have breakfast at any point. I can make another pot of coffee or switch to tea or I can, I can do whatever I want. Right? Mm-hmm. It's. Mm-hmm. It's not going down the pit face, right? We're not, 
we're not really struggling over here, but it is a very different look, it is a very different experience and maintaining that balance. And, and I'd actually, I'll revisit something we talked about a wee while ago, which is, I know during the pandemic, some of us, pointing the elbows, where we're starting to, you know, drink a little earlier in the day. Okay. And that, and, and I, I addressed it, I mentioned on the podcast and going like saying, you know, I, I went a couple of days without a drink and I really felt like I could achieve something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And other problematic sentences, uh-huh. Um, uh-huh. and I, I would, I would say, in these summer months, my drinking has fallen off a cliff, and I, and I don't say that as as someone who's normally weather related drinking. You and I have talked about this plenty. Yes. You know, yep. drink peated whiskey in the <laughs> dog days of summer, and and not think twice about it. Drink a nice heavy stout the dog days of summer, and mm. not think twice mm. about it. I just haven't really been thinking about it it hasn't really been registering for me i i would maybe pour a, a little fino sherry from the fridge while making dinner you, you know that that's been quite lovely but but beer no i barely even have any beer in the house um oh. i'm sure my wife would disagree with that analysis uh, <laughs> Didn't you I mean, just have to buy a shed speaking. for all the beer you have? <laughs> I mean, relatively speaking. And <laughs> and then, yeah, the, the whiskeys, you know, and, and then you and I just did it before we hit record. Like, okay, what are we going to drink today? And then we we looked and we looked and we looked. And, and then I certainly said, oh, there's one. And then you you certainly committed to yours. And so Ooh, I, I, I think three, we should. By the way, I, th- I have three things. <laughs> See, only the one for me. But but like we do in our in our end of year, mm-hmm. let's let's see let's see if we can hazard a guess as to what is in Joshua's glass. Ooh, all right. So okay. Knowing that I will be nosing and sipping on mine the whole time I'm playing the guessing game. All right. So I'm what what do you want? Am I just to give you some tasting notes? I forgot how this game works. Am I just... Well, de- give- definitely let us see the color. Like, I'm glad we're getting this uh, practice okay, in before okay, we record okay, yeah, the yep. the year in review <laughs> episode. Oh, oh, try and keep it away from the camera. That was... You didn't see that? Moved a little fast. All I saw was tall, clear round. Okay. Yep. So there you go. So, aka every generic scotch whiskey bottle there is, or spirits bottle there is. All right. So here is your color. Can you describe it for the... For the listeners, I would say over this uh, video, this this is looking. I would say like a, a pleasing amber. Yeah, I think pleasing amber is is nice. There's, I would argue, there's some orange flecked gold going on in there, as well. There you go. There you go. Okay. Um. <laughs> <laughs> The, the nose, the nose yes. is incredibly floral, like massively oh, so. One one of the more floral whiskeys that we've bottled, and I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna take this off the table. This is not our thirty year old Beaumore. This is not an FWP <laughs> Beaumore. So my follow up question was: Does the floral lend itself to lavender or soap? Or is it more fresh summer meadow? It's this, it's, it's somewhere in between soap and fresh meadow, but where the hmm. two intersect, it, it's almost this incredibly bright fruitiness of, of star fruit and kiwi. Um, let me, let me. Let me see what the the label here says. If there's some <laughs> notes on the label, yeah. So it talks about tropical fruits, right? But, but they're bright, right? There's there's a really bright tartness that lies again somewhere in between, um, you know, fresh wildflowers and soap, but uh, not not like gross soap, not like a soapy whiskey. Like you ever smell a soap and you're like, boy, if they turned that into a a chewy candy that might taste good. It's like somewhere in between there. And that's okay. that's what I'm getting on the nose immediately. And this is bottled by us, you said. 
This is bottled by us. It was bottled in 2019. <laughs> I hate the recent history ones because <laughs> I'm much, much worse than them. Is this retail? It is retail. Uh-huh. <laughs> and it is a scotch. I never said that. <laughs> uh, see, that's when the... That's when the prosecutor says, objection, leading the witness. And so, all right. Do you, want some, uh, do you want some tasting notes? My attempt to lead the witness failed. So it's a retail that's bright, fruity, with a lot of floral to it, but yeah. not a scotch. So let me, let me read you our flavometer, which I would argue is <laughs> not, as I, as I look back at this, I would argue the floral component is off. So, so for, for those listeners who may not be familiar with the Single Cast Nation bottlings, we have on our labels something we call a flavometer, which is a, uh, an eight-point um, eight tasting guide that, you know, for each tasting flavor, you have a one to ten scale, right? So you've got floral, sweet, rich, nutty, spicy, earthy, smoky, woody. And uh, or oaky, I should say, and well, and the and the asp- the the thing I always say about the yeah. flavometer is it's it's a jumping off point, right? Yeah. It it's not the answer key, mm, and so you know even even as the bottle, as I think you're experiencing here, even as the bottle, you know, oxidizes, oh yeah, flavors and notes yeah, go point. in different directions, and yep. so yep. yeah, it, it's never meant to be the hard and fast guidebook. Just jumping off point for conversation or an opportunity to say, man, Jason and Joshua really got this flavometer wrong. <laughs> so speaking of that, uh, the floral component, three out of ten. Which yeah. I will say is higher than floral normally goes. That's true. We've got, we've got so many flavometers that are on one, yeah. which is, it's a whiskey. And then two, which is, oh, I'm actually getting something a bit floral here, to now a three. That's kind of, that's moving, moving and shaking. If I were to, if I were to use the flavometer specifically for the floral component, I would say on the nose, three is correct. But on the palate, it's likely closer to four or five. There you go. Mm-hmm. Right. There you go. Goes on a journey. Yep. So floral. Three out of ten. Sweet, Mm -hmm. six out of ten. Mm -hmm. Rich, six out of ten. (laughs) Nutty, two out of ten. Mm -hmm. Spicy, four out of ten. Earthy, three out of ten. Smoky, one out of ten. And just for our listeners out there, one is also our zero, right? So if we bottled... Uh, whatever a Tam do right? That or no Tam do does use a mild amount of peat. Let's try something else. If we bottled <laughs> <laughs> a Glen Goyne, who famously talk about never ever using peat, we would still leave that as as a one, and because we never we've we've just never put a zero anyway. And then finally, the woody component is a four out of ten. Hmm. I'll be honest, I stopped listening to the flavometer once Dottie made her presence known in the background. That wasn't Dad. Hey, Dally, <laughs> I'm recording, hon. Yeah, what do you say you get on the palate? So, on the palate, I... Because you're get, saying that floral increases on the palate. It, it really does. However, the, the florality seems to bolster this overripe guava note, or maybe like a guava paste no. Did you pour one of our rums? Mm. Mm. <laughs> oh my god, a retail rum. Okay. That, was it US retail or ROW? That, that was my rest of the world. Chamberlain the Skeksy. Mm. <laughs> oh, where's my response from the ones whose name I don't know? Well, here's the thing. My, my fear is that if I tell you which side of the pond we sold it on, you will <laughs> know what it is immediately. <laughs> No, I will not. So, so okay. go ahead. So this was an R O W. This was not bottled for the U S. So it's in a seventy okay. CL or 
for those of you who do milliliters instead of centiliters, it's in a 700 ml bottle. Uh, I'll give you the ABV. 55.4% alcohol. All right. And let, let, me t- let me tell you this. There's a reason I selected this one. So uh-huh. on, on Wednesday, uh, the same day that we got the, the email from our friend James Well, there's, there's only one a year, so I don't from know which Wednesday. other ones you could be talking about. <laughs> I hosted, uh, along with Sam Filmis and Chris Udy, uh, an Impex um, Instagram event with Mitch Wilson of Black Top fame. Who we've had on the on the podcast before, Pat. Terrific Tosk. fellow, absolute terrific. He's fellow. beyond terrific. I don't know what it is about the people at Elixir Distillers between Ollie and Mitch and Chanel and Julie and Andrew, you know, the, Chris Mabin. Right, the list goes on. They're all lovely people. Anyway, when would you call that an incomplete list? It's if a there totally are more names worth right okay. because I didn't incomplete mention Sikinder Singh. That's how incomplete it is. <laughs> Right? Don't make me go on. Everybody else at Elixir Distillers, you're all lovely. Um, <laughs> and so, so after that event, which was, you know, an hour of talking about Black Tot Rum and, and a bit of the history, which is very cool, you know, um, Mitch rung me up and from his, his hotel room in Liverpool. And we got to talking about this particular rum. And he said, oh, I asked him if he ever tasted it. And he had said, I have a friend. And he mentioned the name. I'm not going to mention the name here because I, I, don't, I, I don't know how much of this I'm meant to be sharing. But it is someone who's well known within the rum world to be a massive collector. And it's, it's someone who really knows their, their crap. And Mitch had said he had that person over, and that person saw a sealed bottle of this and said, oh, my gosh, when are we opening that? That is a legend of a bottling. Said, All hmm. right. And, and that, that really sat with me. I mean, it, it, it struck me, I should say, because here we are bottling rum, and if, if a whiskey person said, that's fantastic, I've heard great things, then we say, yeah, of course, that, that's awesome. We're a whiskey company. It's great that a whiskey <laughs> person comes along for the ride. Mm-hmm. But when a rum person says something and, and calls it legendary and says all the nice things about it, it really tells me that we're, we're doing something right. And so I said, I, I need to revisit this and in this time with Jason. So... That's no, I love that. I love hearing all of that. And it is interesting because we haven't thought about selecting rums for rum people. Mm-mm. We've said from the very beginning, we are whiskey people selecting rums that fit our palate. Yeah. And if you've enjoyed our palate on other selections, well, maybe this rum will be for you. And I have sometimes thought in the back of my mind, I wonder how our rum selections sit with rum people. Mm. And so it's really, it's really wonderful to hear in this one instance that we've we've got a home run amongst the rum community. Um, th- there's one in particular jumps out to my mind for our R O W retail rum selections. I'm I'm not convinced it is the one, um, but I'm gonna ask if this is our Trinidad and Tobago selection. It is just that the 16 year old. There we go. It Not the 12-year-old, okay. but the 16-year-old. It is 16, okay. This, this was the one that uh, Serge Valentin called out as his December 2019 Malternative. Ah, yep, that was his this favorite rum. is that. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Well, I have a very, very small rum pile next to me. Let me just clatter for one second. Clitter clatter. Clitter clatter. Clitter. That just sounded like I fell over. I was just trying to make a, a general glass noise. So I have an unopened bottle of that oh, Trinidadian right. rum 16-year-old in my little rum pile. There you go. It's, it's worth Did you opening. say 55.4? Yeah, 55.4. Did, oh, I, did I have that right? I, I just 55, don't 4. remember. That's yep. all. Yep. 
All right. Do you want to read the, the truncated tasting note on the label? So, yes. Yeah, so the truncated tasting notes say syrupy in texture and rich in flavor. This Trinidadian rum offers up loads of tropical fruit notes, both on the nose and palate, but the sherry cask influence. That's right. This was a refill sherry hobby. <laughs> I forgot about that. Oh, man. Um, wow. Okay. The, <laughs> the sherry cask influence presents unmistakable notes of candied prunes, dates, and fresh figs. A decent treat to be sure. It's so interesting um, <laughs> that the label notes highlight that because for me it's more of these sort of dank tropical fruit notes. And, and I hadn't even been thinking about the specific cask. I'm thinking about this distillery's spirit. And, and how our selection, our own bottling, squares with the rest of their own line, you know? But, but I think it also speaks to whiskey doesn't exist in a, in a vacuum. Rum doesn't exist in a vacuum. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm looking at that having a bottled in April means we would have been working on the tasting notes. Uh, no, and, bottled uh, in August. Bottled in August. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was produced in April, right? Correct. Yep. So so we'd be working on our, our tasting notes and our and our labels probably in the spring of that year. We wouldn't have been working on them as late as July into August, uh, right? Yeah, it, yeah. it would have been earlier than that to give us a good runway. And so I think when you drink something and you write some notes in the in the spring it's different than enjoying it in the middle of the summer. And, and I don't mean the notes themselves are changing, but our reading of those notes have mm. the potential to change based on, you know, sitting here in shorts and a T-shirt, having a window open, being outside, <laughs> right? It, 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 it's all context point, all right? the time. That, that's, that's a really good point. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm looking at the bottle and there's, there's a third out the bottle, so there's been a, a bit of oxidation as well, and that might be highlighting different things for whatever reasons science makes that happen. Um, <laughs> you know, it, science, <laughs> quote unquote, science. Um, but it, it it is such a satisfying little rum. I'm really I'm really pleased by it, and and again just. To use to use a word of your people, Jason, I am chuffed to hear that that people have really taken to this and have put it amongst, you know, these more historical bottlings as uh, you know something that is worth seeking out. Yeah, gosh, I'm I'm hearing about it the same time as our listeners, and I'm 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 very pleasantly surprised. <laughs> so. Um, so, so I tell you, in, in a lot of what we were talking about here, I've actually got an email also ready to go in a different portion of the podcast. But have a little guess of what's on my glass because I've now poured my second right. of it. And so I probably need you to, to tell the listeners what it is before I either pour a third or move on to something else. Okay, so, okay. so I, I need the color. So, so all right, there's, there's a, a bright, that's interesting. It seems to be yeah. vacillating between bright gold and and pale hay. Oh, I think you're spot on, actually. I yeah. think it is both of those things. There you go. All right. <sighs> oh, yeah. All <laughs> Any right. more questions? <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll take okay. no more questions so, at this time. So, so give, me, give me the nose. Well, first off, is it one of our bottlings? It is. It is. Okay. It is. And even before the nose, I will tell you the oiliness mm-hmm. around the top of the glass is formidable and makes me incredibly happy. Is it single malt? <laughs> oh, so now we're in 20 questions territory. <laughs> okay. Is it is it a mammal? Does it live <laughs> it on It does land? have four legs, but it is not a mammal. <laughs> uh, okay, I I, I'll, I'll, I retract my question. Give me some tasting. Okay. Notes. It is funny, a bit like when we've been playing the, the Michael Jackson first edition companion game, there are some words in these notes that if I gave you, you would get it right away. And it is funny reading our, our truncated tasting note on the Trinidadian rum, yeah. where it says 
Trinidadian rum. So, <laughs> um, so I, I will say, yeah, we've got a very bright, fruity nose, pleasant citrus happening here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> key key notes of spice happening, okay. and spicy, citrusy, and a very specific citrus. <laughs> oh, interesting. A specific <laughs> citrus. Oh wow. Okay. So what are my what are my citrus fruits? Right? So I've got limes, I've got lemons, I've got oranges, I've got grapefruits, I've got kumquats. You just wanted me to say kumquat, Jason. I see I what you did. I did not think that word was gonna come out of your mouth. So here we are. Now we're all sitting awkwardly looking at each other thinking, did Josh just say kumquat? <laughs> Oh my gosh, kiwis! Uh, kiwis uh, are citrus. Like now, now we've derailed the conversation. So, so it's, okay. So we've got. Oh gosh, citrusy, there is a florality to this as well. Spicy, a gentle florality. Gentle, or oh. or is it is it pronounced? No, it's it's subtle. It's certainly in harmony with the the other uh, things that are happening. I would even go as far as to say, quite perfumed and i don't mean that as in def- fwp mm. i mean quite perfumed as in it's incredibly present as a nose yeah. it's incredibly present hmm. okay yeah yeah it's a it's a it's a big one it really is oh, a, okay uh um, yeah give me some give me some so that's that's those are your nose notes your nasal notes give me some of your mouth notes Unctuous texture, as you'd expect. Okay. Given the the oils that were rimming oh, okay. the glass. Okay. More of that citrus, yeah. almost um, chocolate coated orange peels oh, okay. on the palate. Oh, okay. Good warmth to it. Good heft. More presence. Okay. Still citrus. Some malty sweetness okay. going on <laughs> uh, in the body of it. <laughs> I th- I it th- is one of our yeah. bottlings, but it does not have a flavometer. Oh, it doesn't have a flavometer. Okay, so that changes the. <laughs> oh man, I was down a path. I was so far down a path until you said it doesn't have a flavometer. Now, nope. retreat. Um, okay, a retail bottling. It is not. It is not a retail bottling. It is, and, and just for the benefit of the readers, it is interesting yeah. that we've each gone with one of our own bottlings because when we were selecting what we wanted to pour and just what we wanted to taste and what we wanted to talk about, there were no rules. It was just, yeah, yeah, just grab yeah. any, yep. any bottle yep. that you want to. And we did both gravitate towards our own. So here we are. Here we are. Okay, so so it, it's not a retail. Okay, let me ask you this. Is it a wraparound label or is it from the older two label system? It's a single label. Single label. All the single labels, all, all the single, single labels, labels, all the single labels, all the single labels. Oh, uh, uh, put your uh, labels uh, up, uh. up. Um. <laughs> huh. Okay. Let me. Is it. Is it malt whiskey? It is not. It is not malt whiskey. And just uh, just like I just like I replace sentences in the Michael Jackson companion when we're playing that game, the style of whiskey is known for its orange gumdrop spicy profile. Huh. I did not expect that response from you. Well, I really did not. Yeah, maybe maybe it's the rum I'm drinking here. Uh, orange spiced gumdrop. Yeah, I'm sure there's listeners right now that are like, yeah, it's, uh. <laughs> yeah. You and I have said this from the first time we ever tasted this style. So it's a, it's a specific style of whiskey. It is malt whiskey. It's a single label system. Do you remember previously when I said it is not malt whiskey? Oh no, I don't remember. I don't know if you answered that. 
Did you answer yeah, that? I said, it is not. Oh, remember, I only listened to 25% of what you said. That was 0%. Wow. Okay. Normally, we're at least on one square on the flavometer. Okay. This time, we're on zero squares. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, I can't believe you didn't listen to the answer to your own question. <laughs> are you talking to me? Yeah, I just say you're just saying things into the into the ether. Is this it is why American? I'm glad we've got is it American whiskey? Of course, it's an American whiskey. Is it rye whiskey? It is not rye whiskey. What the? F- <laughs> what American whiskey gives you orange spiced gumdrops? Oh, you are gonna kick your I'm totally own ass gonna when kick this is revealed. <laughs> oh my gosh! Uh, is it? Well, okay, so. Uh. This is so much better than I even dreamed of it be. I thought that was going to be the slam dunk. So he, so here's the thing, right? Yes, sir. When I think of American whiskeys, <laughs> I think, what does rye have? Rye has a spiciness to it, sometimes a mm-hmm. citrusiness to it. Mm. More often, especially if it's MGP, a dill-like note. Oh. Sometimes a mustard seed. Sometimes a mustard seed, right? Sometimes. It's, it's that herbaceousness coming through, right? But so, so you said it's a no to rye, okay? Definitely has a mustard seed component, though. Definitely. <sighs> oh, wait a second. Definitely. God damn it. Unmistakable. Okay, okay. <laughs> so it is a rye? What's happening? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to show you the label because I want the, the listeners to hear your reaction and how hard you have to kick your own ass. You ready to see the label? Uh, okay. Put me out of my misery. Go Here ahead. comes the reveal. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> you, I can't believe you. That was oh. awesome. How many years have we spent saying American light whiskey has this orange Binge spice gumdrop yes. quality to it? And then we took this <sighs> cask and put it in an ex beer cask with mustard seed. <laughs> yeah, and you're like, mustard seed. Did I happen to mention mustard seed? <laughs> <laughs> and the citrus, like the hop oils from the beers, the malty sweetness. Oh, or maybe that's where you misled yourself. Because I talked about the malty sweetness mm. from the beer cask. Right. And not, not it being a malt whiskey. Yeah, you know, to, to, to be fair, though, uh, to, to, <laughs> nope. to defend you and, <laughs> no. not, and surely not oh, myself. Okay. Yeah, I'll take defense. What, At, what do I need defending from? Well, you, you're, trying to, you're trying to give me... Um, as many hints as I could. Well, you're trying to give me a bit of an out by saying, well, I did mention the maltiness, right? And and while I appreciate that, as I was sitting here trying to think of the various American <laughs> whiskeys that we've bottled, I was thinking rye, I was thinking bourbon, I was thinking malt whiskey, and never once did I think light whiskey, despite the fact that that we'd been bottling light whiskey since 2013. <laughs> yeah. 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 But that's, and that's why I was saying a moment ago about that context and, and the context for drinking mm. is when we were looking around, okay, what, what do we want to be drinking here? The fact that you went to a rum yeah. And I went to a light whiskey, yep. screams the temperature that we're currently sitting in <laughs> at the end of July. And I just want yeah. something that is much brighter, right? And I know we said earlier, we do drink peated whiskeys in this time of year. Oh, yeah. And I will be pouring a peated whiskey very shortly. <laughs> yep. Ooh, Josh is moving on. And... And so just for, for full disclosure for the listeners, this was our first Whiskey Jubilee Chicago bottling. Uh, this is MGP Light Whiskey, uh, which is essentially American grain whiskey, mixed mash bill, continuous column distillation, uh, you know, limited maturation, you know, reused wood, refill wood on it. And... And then, as I say, we 
We took the whiskey, we put it into an ex-beer barrel, partnering with our friends at Schmaltz. There was the addition of mustard seeds, fresh mustard <laughs> seeds, which were spectacular. <laughs> and, and we bottled this at 65.1% alcohol because the oils are such yeah. that it doesn't blow out your palate. It doesn't immediately dissipate across the palate. There are plenty of notes to chew on and thoroughly enjoy. And and I've said it before when people have said, you know, what what do you reach for uh, of a night? You know, th- this invariably is is one I love pouring and I love returning to. I drink a lot of this. Yeah, absolutely delicious. So, 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 Joshua. Yeah. Before before we go too far, much farther down the path here, I want to read this email to you that came into the info at singlecasknation.com. You printed account. it out. Look at you. Old school. So here's the thing, Joshua. You know this as, as well as I do. See, when we're recording, I turn off as much as I possibly can so that I can hear 100% of what you're saying and I don't get distracted, oh, and I don't right. I don't see the squirrel, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, you know, popping popping out of my inbox. That sounds like a horrible euphemism. Moving on, the <laughs> subject. Hey, do you see the squirrel pop out of my inbox? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were taking medicine for that. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a salve. <laughs> so Sean Parent sent this in, and again, just like Foster, this actually just came in uh, a couple of days ago, and. And the subject really caught my attention because it it made me immediately panic about what my own response was going to be. Okay. Because because an email that comes into our info account with the subject, did I buy the wrong bottle, question mark, (laughs) really makes me nervous. So this didn't come into questions at One Nation Under Whiskey. It It came to info at single... uh, That's why you hadn't seen it. That's why you hadn't read it. And that's why I didn't tell you where it was. And I printed it so that I could have it be unread and uh, and not have it count uh, in the inbox. So, so it, really quickly, just for our listeners, just just to be very clear here, the the email account you're talking about is one <laughs> is one that I no I, I have to talk about it. Don't you laugh at me, Jason? It, this is the one where people reach out to us when they have questions about their orders. If there's an issue, there's very rarely an issue, <laughs> but sometimes there are issues, right? And and so the fact that this came into the email where people are checking on orders and this person is asking, did I, what was the subject line? Did I buy the wrong bottle? I could see why you were nervous <laughs> reading that subject line. So anyway, just to close the circle there, I really wanted to, to highlight Ooh. that there. Yeah, cheers. Yeah, it, it really it really resonated when uh, when I saw it. Um, also, to, to add in that neither you nor I are actually in charge of the info account anymore either. So, <laughs> so to actually see true. it kind of float by uh, was kind of like, oh boy, is that going to be a problem for the team? So, hello, Jay and JJ, hmm. comma. Oh, from uh, yeah, JJ. <laughs> For the guys, it says dynamite. It's from uh, Good Times. Long time listener, first time emailer. Okay. That that started to make me feel a little bit better yeah, once yeah, yeah, once yeah, we sure. got there. Yep. <laughs> and then the opening uh, of the next sentence made me feel worse again. I have had a bug in my craw since Christmas. Oh boy, yeah, that doesn't sound good. Ooh, okay, here we are in July. Okay, let's. Uh, oh boy. It's been ruminating. All right. And then the second half of that sentence, I fell on top of the world. And I think this is a fantastic email that I immediately wanted to include in One Nation Under Whiskey. Good. So, continue. Hello, Jay and JJ. Long time listener, first time emailer. I have had a bug in my cross since Christmas over a bottle of Laphroaig that I gifted to my sister. Hmm. Isn't that intriguing? Right? You, you just made an intriguing yeah. face. Yeah, that's my, intri- that's my face of intrigue. Yeah. It was a bottle of their Scotch Single Malt Select. And when she opened it, her boyfriend responded, 
Oh, it's the select. In a manner that gave the impression that I had tried to pass off a bottle of swill as a <laughs> bottle of quality <laughs> spirit. Isn't this brilliant? This is so wow. good. Okay. And, and he goes on. Did I not gift her a quality scotch? Hmm. I am not a connoisseur of whiskey slash scotch and thought this was going to be a good bottle. Hmm. They didn't even open it to see how it performed. Sad face emoji. Oh, wow. I started to listen to your pad cost. Good job, Sean. That's way to get Jason Josh on your side. Well done. I started to listen to your podcast in an effort to educate myself on what to drink and how, because I do like the taste of scotch. Boy, oh, do I. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. Right? I thought a Laphroaig single malt select would be a good choice given both of your opinions mm. on Laphroaig mm-hmm. and this particular bottle was in my price wheelhouse. Sure. Am I to stay away from a brand's select offering? Question mark. And then then he goes on to say, not that this is a Padcost email, but feel free to use my name. Listen, Sean, everything's a potential Padcost email. (laughs) And I think you knew that when you wrote in. Uh, So this is not a surprise. Uh, Keep up the great work. And maybe every now and then throw in a tip for a novice like myself. There Signed, you go. Sean. Isn't that brilliant? That's Absolutely a brilliant, brilliant. So let me let me say one thing first that I need to get off my chest because we had this exact conversation in my recent John into the wilderness mm-hmm. about gift giving. Yeah. Right. And we were split along someone's given you specifically we were talking a, a whiskey gift yep someone's given you a gift and you go oh thanks and someone's given you a whiskey gift that you look at and you know a bit about whiskey and you say okay i know where that lives in the pantheon of whiskey thanks ever so much for thinking about me thanks ever so much for your gift yeah right yeah and we were we were split as a group. I, you will not be shocked to hear, am of the thank you ever so much for thinking of me. Thanks ever so much for this gift. That's very kind. Hell, let's open it. Let's pour some drams from you this. Let's yep. Yep. let's toast right now. And there's the other half who seem to fit into what Sean's describing mm. with. Uh, he seems to be leaning more towards the boyfriend of the sister and not laying this at the sister's doorstep. Um, but but certainly the, the boyfriend seems to have had a, oh, that's what you did? Yeah. Yeah. I also, I also don't know what country Sean is in. Um, and so when I, when I read things like, mm. boy, yo, oh, do I, you know, is, I, I don't know if that's... Oh, uh, yeah, are you making assumptions? If, if you were to... Just off the top of your head, make an assumption. What country do you think Boyo oh, Do I comes from? Boyo oh, Do I? I don't know. I don't know. I, I Honestly, I read it as someone emailing us from the UK. Yeah, I read it as someone emailing us from 1956. <laughs> Maybe it's the paper boy. The paper boy has finally boy. risen up. <laughs> but I tell you, I like it. I need to include that because I... I, I've got in my own my own you know uh, lexicon of phrases like I say jeepers creepers a lot or my good golly gosh I'm like boy oh do I that 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 fits golly like gosh that. gee Whitakers is a go to <laughs> for me so so there you go so so first huh. of all I'm I am I'm a little bit upset that that somebody thought about their sister. Somebody went to the store, they worked out their budget for gift giving, they found a distillery connected to positive things that you and I have said, and the gift fell flat. I'm I'm really upset for Sean. I now have a bug in my craw, and I will have it all the way till Christmas too. Yeah, Yeah, and I I don't blame you, because... I think I think your two scenarios are correct. Those those typically would be the two reactions, and the secondary one 
whether you like it or not, whether you are may re-gift it to someone, not suggesting that's what someone should do, but, you know, I, I just, I think that there are general agreed upon social contracts where you say, thanks so much <laughs> for thinking about me. Right, absolutely. Because in the end, that's what it was. Sean thought about his sister and said, have I got a whiskey for you? But I wonder if you're in a similar boat to me, which is people know how into whiskey you are. People know how much whiskey you have. Mm-hmm. And so they just simply decide not to buy you whiskey Yeah, for yeah. fear of getting you the wrong one. And I and I occasionally run into those moments when somebody finds out I'm into whiskey without mm-hmm. me going into too much detail and then says, oh, I got this for you. <laughs> and, if it, and if it hasn't exactly hit the spot, you still say, thanks ever so much, right? Yeah. And, but I will tell you, somebody who yeah. actually just hit a recent home run is, is our very own Bert Bumgartner, uh, who I've, I've been spending a good amount of time with this summer. And because he spent time with me and Jess in Scotland and in Campbelltown, and we mm-hmm. took good care of him and we introduced him to a bunch of people, he gave me a, a bottle that was from a private octave of Glen Glasser. Oh. And it, it, it's a bottling that he particularly loves. And he gifted me one of his bottles to say thanks for, for everything in Scotland. That's very home nice. run. Total but, home run. Total home run. But, but, but invariably, people just don't buy me whiskey. Yeah. You're in the same boat, I assume? Oh, 100%. Uh, well... I, a couple of years ago, actually, just right before COVID, we had a, a bit of a get together at our house, and we had a newer guest come over. I'm not going to mention any names, but it's you know one of, one of Haida's old friends, and he brought a bottle of whiskey because he knew I was into whiskey, and it wasn't a top shelf whiskey. I, I have a bottle of it myself, um, and I make highballs with it. It's a wonderful highball whiskey. And but it, it it is not a it's not a wonderful sipping whiskey. It is just a nice blend. But he thought, right? This this is a guy I'd never met, and he thought, you know, Haida's right. husband is into whiskey. I'm going to buy him a bottle. It was wrapped nicely. Like he he went kind of over the top in his presentation. And I thought, how nice! You don't even like he. It was like a a. a peace offering it was wonderful i loved it and and that's the response you have doesn't it doesn't right. matter what it is you just <laughs> right. say thank you because that person <laughs> thought of you do, do you think though there's a little bit of a get it a jail free card involved with whiskey here because we're all so into it and we're always giving our honest opinions about yeah. it do you think there's a place where this stops being a gift as such and just becomes the value judgment of Lafroig Select? Huh. Which I don't think you know, I don't think really lets anybody out of jail free. I, I still think that this gift was poorly received by the recipients and not poorly gifted by the giver. Exactly. And and well <laughs> and here's the thing. Let let's talk about Lafroy Select in particular. That bottling is real seemingly so is made to is made almost as an entryway into Lafroy, right? Like yeah. Sean had said, the, the price was right. It fit it fit into his budget. That's what yeah. it's meant to do, right? Yeah. And it also seems, you know, people talk about Lafroy and even the way Lafroy talks about Lafroy as a love it or hate it thing because of the intensity of the peat in it. This is a less intense Lafroy. It's meant to be that stepping stone into the category. And I yeah. would argue that while it may not stand on its own amongst the best Lafroigs in the world, it's one of the better stepping stones into the category of Isla peated Scotch whiskey. So I think not only was the gift poorly received, (laughs) 
but the understanding <laughs> of what that bottling was was potentially poorly received. Like maybe the boyfriend was drinking at a different level and therefore had his reaction. But we don't know the situation of Sean's sister and where she is, where she is in her own whiskey journey. He bought for her, right? Not for him, for her. Right, yeah. It's... So, I, I mean, would I buy someone Laphroaig Select? Damn straight I would, especially people who are peak curious. It's a lower ABV. It's a bit more gentle. Give it a go. You need that stepping stone. Not everybody can, like, go full Pete right off the bat. So I, so I wouldn't. and Would you not? It, it, only because if we're looking at price point, one of, one of the things I enjoy the most mm. about knowing a thing or two about whiskey is knowing price points. And the thing, if someone ever reaches out to me and says, look, I've got so much budget to spend on somebody, what should I get them? First question is, what do they like to eat? What do they like to drink? Do they have other scotches on their shelves? Now, your budget might be 100. Let's see what we can get for 60. Let's see what we can get. And I'm talking a few years ago now. I'm talking two decades ago now. Let's see what we can get for 35. But now it's, (laughs) let's let's see what we can get for 60. And let's save you money on your budget. Because you don't need to go that high to get a good thing. But... What kind of strength do they like? What kind of region do they like? Right? What kind of pronounced flavors yeah. do they do they like? And and, and I, it's funny because as as you've been talking, I've been listening to every word. I've also been thinking about <laughs> this is the second time <laughs> you've called out me not listening to all of your words, and I will point out I have counted them both two. And I'm going to keep <laughs> counting. <laughs> well, it's funny you should say that because I've mentioned it three times. But here we are. <laughs> But 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 again, right? In 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 Sean saying, you guys say good things about Lafroig, so yeah. I thought a Lafroig would be a bit of a home run sure. for me. It goes to show that a distillery's lineup isn't created equal. There are entry points that then lead to higher points exactly. that then simply lead to more expensive points. Yeah, and so I I wouldn't recommend you know. Lafroy, you know, God, do they have a standard twenty-five, a standard thirty? Like, I wouldn't recommend an old Lafroy that's really expensive no, as a no, no. slam dunk winner no. on flavor. More than I would recommend Lafroy ten cast strength, right? Yeah. Or even straight up Lafroy ten, right? Or quarter cask for that matter. But, but the the point is, we also had our episode of each of us naming five whiskeys. Mm-hmm that should be on every shelf. And and when I think about, and obviously I mention it all the time, Glasgow blend, uh, right, from, from Compass Box. Yeah. That's got a little bit of Laphroaig in it, mm-hmm. but it's as part of a larger blend. So you get that little bit of smoke. And I'm thinking the way Sean's kind of telling this story, I'm sure if the boyfriend had seen the sister being gifted with a blended whiskey... It'd be even like, worse. That's what I'm exactly, thinking. Exactly, exactly. Despite it being a fantastic whiskey. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And so to me, that's that's the point of do your research, decide if you're committed to that gift, and mm. Sean was committed to that gift. Mm-hmm. And if someone has the balls to turn around and say, oh, it's that, tell them where to get off, right? <laughs> and, and I think that's his point, right? They didn't even open it to see how I performed, right? They just went, oh, that's that, in a corner. That's ah, What a failing all around, all around. Yeah, so, so you said you wouldn't gift the Laphroaig Select. Mm. So, I mean, I, I'll be honest it wouldn't be the first thing that I would necessarily select. Oh, not, see because, what you did there? not because I think... Yeah, what? I didn't even see what I did there, Jason. I only saw what I did there when you pointed out what I did there. While it wouldn't be my first bottling to gift, I wouldn't rule it out. Especially if, you know, it, every situation is different, right? If you've, you may have... Someone who says, you know, I've, I've heard things about Isla Scotch whiskey and I've heard good things about Laphroaig. What do I do? Well, all right. Do you like smoky? Well, I don't like smoky that much. Okay. 
right? So, so you see where I'm going with this. Like, just like you had said, when someone says, hey, I want a suggestion on a whiskey, and you ask, what do you like to drink? What do you like to eat? Are there any other scotches? Do you like bourbon? Which ones? Right, to help narrow you in. So we don't know what was said to get Sean to the point where he selected this bottle, but but it would be within my own you know, slate of bottlings to offer up as an entry point into Isla Scotch whiskey. Yeah. I just I just don't think Select represents the best of the distillery, which brings us to a key point raised by Sean. Am I to not okay. trust yeah, so a that's, brand's Select offering? That's that's okay, so that's a fair point, because I will agree with you. And actually I'll 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 say this about Lafroig which I, I find, I've been finding quite interesting. They're one of my favorite distilleries of all time. I'm, I'm going to lead with that. Yeah. However, there have been over the past, I would say, eight to ten years or so where certain bottlings have come out, and they're not bad whiskeys. They're not bad representations of Isla Scotch whiskey, but they're not necessarily recognizable as Laphroaig. And there's mm-hmm. a difference between saying that's a good Laphroaig and that's a good Isla whiskey, right? So I think that's, yep. is that what you're kind of trying to get yeah. at? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I think you could get representations of Isla at a better price point that I, I think just show better. Like, <laughs> no surprises here. You you represent them. I don't. I, get, don't, I don't get paid for this comment. But... Colhoman Macro Bay, yeah. right? Boom, 40, 46% alcohol, predominantly bourbon cast maturation, and you're getting something crisp. You're getting something where the peat shines right through. There's not a lot coming between you and that whiskey. Boom, done. Yeah. And then you get to say to somebody, right, oh, let me tell you about Colhoman. Let me say a bit more. You know, I, I don't know what people do and don't know about Colhoman in 2022, but... There's there's a potential conversation there as well, oh, yeah. which can also sometimes serve you that zig instead of that zag, where someone goes, well, I know Lafroig and this ain't it. When you hand them Kilhoman, they go, what's Kilhoman? Mm. <laughs> or what's Kilchoman? Or what's Kikoman? What's Kikoman? And so, <laughs> so there are other conversations to be had there, and you get to kind of show a different side to the research you've put in. Yeah, so, I mean, the fact of the matter is, as a whiskey drinker, I do the same. I, I suggest Kilhome and Macker Bay all the time because that really is my go-to isla, especially in the summertime. Another thing we talked about, what PD whiskeys are you drinking in the summer? It's Macker Bay. But I'm, I'm always, especially on this podcast, I feel as if I'm living a bit on the edge here, right? Because I never want to come off as just trying to be the Kilhome and salesman, right? This yeah. is a podcast yeah. that is separate of that. Yeah. That life that, as as a whiskey. That's sales, my sales unpaid person. job. Thank that's you very your much. That's your unpaid job. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so so let's let's have it really quickly because I think did Sean ask us what our suggestions would be? He did not, but he said just like you had a, a couple of episodes ago when you'd said somebody had really resonated to the cocktail idea, mm. and we thought, oh, we should we should periodically revisit cocktails. I thought Sean's closing point, maybe every now and then throw in a tip for a novice like myself. So there you go. It's and, a tip. And, one of the, and one of the things for us, you know, in season six of the podcast. Just the tip, is we, Jason. Just the tip. Just, I, I said that season one, episode one, and it's just never been true, but it is always <laughs> the tip with you. And so... And so we, we used to have the misconception at the end of the episode yeah. and try to get back to remembering some of those tips that you could store mm-hmm. away for the next mm-hmm. time you're in a liquor store. But I And I think along the way, and I, I spoke a moment ago about the episode where it was your top five for a shelf, my top five for a shelf. But I think mm. periodically, I think it it would pay to remember what's happening at the other end of the single cask, cask strength, uh, first fill bourbon, <laughs> uh, limited release world. So, uh-huh. so if you, it's so, so here's, here's Sean and he's writing in and he's listening to us. 
and he's a novice. What's what's something Sean should should stick in his back pocket to to carry forth with? So I, I want to make sure that I'm answering this question or, or giving the correct advice. When he says, are there any tips as you read it? And, and again, this was 10 minutes ago that you read it. And so I've forgotten most of the words. <laughs> was it, do you have any tips for better gift giving? Or do you have any tips for uh, other bottles that should be on the shelf? No, I just took it as... What's the type of thing I should keep in mind as I'm beginning this journey? Okay, here, 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 here's what I would say. It, it sounds like he likes Scotch whiskey. Boyo, does he like Scotch whiskey? <laughs> Do you say boy howdy? What does he say? Boyo. <laughs> Boyo. Boyo. And we've mentioned this before, right? Um, I would find a couple of blogs that you find very interesting where you enjoy the tasting notes. And we've mentioned this before in in the podcast. Mm-hmm. This was part of, you know, sort of at least my own journey where, you know, I found Serge at Whiskey Fun and Ruben at Whiskey Notes and, and your your own blog, you know, years back is Whiskey Host. And I would read mm-hmm. these tasting notes for bottlings that I have heard of. And then I would either get a bottle or find a sample or go to a bar and I would... If those notes seemed interesting, I'd get a sample of that or I'd go to a bar and get a pour of it to see if I was finding the notes that that reviewer was finding and and if I liked it. And if it was, then I knew the reviewers at least that my palate aligned with. And then I can start going down that rabbit hole. And as you go further down that rabbit hole, as you're starting to look at gift giving... The more you drink, the more yeah. context you have for exactly. expanding what you could potentially be giving as a gift. Hundred percent. No, I, I think that's that's absolutely spot on. There's there's no substitute for active time spent engaging with the world of whiskey. And I would I would get a malt whiskey yearbook and I would read up and I would dip into mm-hmm. Dave Broom and I would dip back into Michael Jackson and Charlie McLean and you know I, I would really go and explore that world and gain context for what's being discussed. Yeah. Cause I because yeah. I think in, in this email, you've got on one level Lafroig is a good distillery. Lafroig can be trusted in their offerings. There's a budget point at which I engaged with this distillery. Like there's a lot of context to what was acquired here. Yeah. And just because it says Lafroig on the tin doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be the best Lafroig you can get your hands on, nor should you be looking to spend 500 pounds or $500 or $1,000 or what have you to get the best of the best, right? Mm. That's not any more true. So, yeah gather information, gain uh, information, and and yeah, listen, learn. And the other thing that I would point out too, and this is just a bit more defense for for our friend Sean here, if if we were to go back through our podcast and listen to the number of times that you have mentioned Mm Lafroig, it's predominantly connected to their 10-year-old cask strength, Mm -hmm. which is not something I would necessarily gift anybody unless I knew they had experience with cask strength whiskeys. Yeah. Right? And and so he would find himself in a bit of a pickle, right? You do talk about Lafroy. But if you offered, again, we don't know his sister's palate. If he gave her the Lafroy 10-year-old cask strength, maybe her boyfriend would have been over the moon. <laughs> Hooray for him. <laughs> But maybe she wouldn't have loved it, right? I mean, hundred percent, so, Joshua, hundred <laughs> percent. Well, There's but, more to this story, yeah. right? There's more to this story. I hope Sean had a quiet, chitty chatty with his sister. Although he does say he's had a bug in his cross since Christmas, so that's seven full months of. Oh, I'm glad he's got friends in us to reach out to because we're a hundred percent on Sean's side on yeah, this. Yeah, I one, mean, so. and basically at this point, his sister's boyfriend is a villain. 
He just sounds oh, like yeah. a villain oh, at this point. <laughs> absolutely. Every time we mention him, I boo in my own head. So he could turn out to be a lovely fellow know, just had exactly. this one moment on Christmas yeah, Day. Yeah. Like all we have to go on is four words and we've already decided death to the boyfriend. Right. I hope they break up at some point. <laughs> Who knows? He may have just had like one too many eggnogs and had an off comment. <laughs> or maybe the tone was all wrong. Maybe he said, oh, it's the select, but it never got translated in that way, right? <laughs> um, here, listen, one final thing and then we'll get out of this and onto something else. But Sean does ask us the question, did I not gift her a quality scotch? And I have one constant response to this, okay. which is, you gifted her a single malt scotch. That's a delightful, delightful category yes. in which to be playing. And so I would say, yes, you did, but it was the select. Yeah, I would say, yes, you did. And I think that he took the safe route. I I. I applaud him for doing that. Again, I'm going to fall back on, is it a great Laphroaig? No. Is it a good Isla Scotch whiskey? It's a wonderful door opener. And there's there's nothing wrong about it as a single malt Scotch whiskey from Isla, but it's not necessarily the best representation of Laphroaig. Tell you what, though, his sister can't argue with the price. Free. Free. Well, uh, you know who can argue with the price? Paperboy? The paperboy. Her boyfriend. The paper boyfriend. <laughs> extra, extra. We all are about it. Life story of Playboy Penny. Extra, extra. Extra, extra. We all about it. Me and that Playboy in trouble. Again. We have so much news to be reporting. About 14 casks worth of news. If, uh, if my count is correct, we may not be talking about all 14 casks, but we've got a bit of news to share about product that we're about to actually air freight in to the U.S. It's true. It has been a long time coming. Some might say half a year. Some might say a little bit longer than that. But it's finally upon us. We do have a lot of liquid in a lot of bottles, and it's very exciting. And I and I say that in a in a calm tone, because we're still waiting on it getting on a plane, <laughs> and we're still waiting on it getting into yeah. America. Yeah, yeah, there was that. It's not a done deal yet, but we are we're getting there. We're closer than we have been in seven months. So we've done, yes, exactly. We were far closer uh, than, than we had been. <laughs> so the interesting thing about these casks is that a, num- a number of them are for our own online platform rather than retail. But the, the and I think there's five of them, actually, and it's taking a slightly different form than what we've done in the past. I, I think we've, we've been decent in championing world single malts, right? We've, we've bottled Irish. We've bottled Cooley, right? We've bottled Amrut. We've bottled Paul, Paul, yeah. we've bottled Paul John. We've bottled M&H and so on, Pendaren. and But they've always been one single cask of a larger offering that has been of many more scotch whiskeys, right? Or like scotch malt whiskeys. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, part, part of a retail release. Part of a retail release. To exactly. go out with grain and malt and rum. So yeah. But this time around, four of our five online bottlings are world whiskeys. And there's only one Scotch whiskey, albeit, holy crap, has this particular Scotch whiskey got to blow people's minds. So uh, let's start with that one, right? We'll, we'll end with the world whiskeys. We'll lead with the Scotch whiskeys. So the first one is a Daluin. This one is a nine-year-old, uh, a bit shy of being 10. But it has an interesting story to it. So we, we bought it as an ex-bourbon cask. 
and it was accidentally put into <laughs> a first fill sherry cask for finishing. <laughs> oh gosh. And we said, oh geez. Okay, well let's let's follow it, right? Let's let's follow it along and, and see how, how it does. The color on it is remarkable. Not that we're color guys. <laughs> but holy what we crap! You, you've got it right. You, you've got it in front of you. I'm actually just checking cast numbers as we're talking here. That's that is not even the right word, let alone the right cast number. I have it somewhere. <laughs> There's a lot of things on my desk. You keep talking. I'll keep looking. <laughs> right. So so a nine year old Deluin. Okay, perfect. So, so I didn't even have to do much talking. Jason's holding up to me a, uh, a small sample bottle of some of the darkest. <laughs> it's somewhere in between black fig and, and deep red pomegranate. That's, that's the color combination I see on this one. I just, I just think it's so funny that we... We talk about finishing in this industry and some people have got a bee in their bonnet around finishing because it's it's taking knackered wood and then putting a whiskey into really active wood to to get color and flavor in there. Yeah. And we we really, because of this accident, <laughs> went down the, yeah, let's take it out of really active wood and let's finish it in some really active wood. <laughs> and, and this, this was going to be my point, right? It came from a really active bourbon cask. <laughs> And it was ready to be bottled as it was, but instead of being bottled, it, it was racked into not just any sherry cast, but this is Spanish oak sherry. Um, and Spanish oak is quite different from European oak. Anyway, nine years, dark as night. Can you give us uh, just a couple different nose and, and tasting notes? Huge red fruits on it. It's just so big, so unctuous. Um, you know, I'll pop a little bit onto the onto the yeah, palate I here. Yeah, want to see if the remind me the, about the the Deluane spice, right? Because and that's exactly it, right? But if you take Spanish oak and you take that one year in first fill, and you've got a a peppery or a spicy spirit going up against that Spanish oak, it's a chance for it to be overwhelmed. Here he goes. He's sipping from the sample bottle. He's swishing mm. it around his mouth. He's making mm. that mmm. Mm -hmm. Face. Mm -hmm. The whiskey that makes you go, mmm. Oh, oh. Look at that. so contemplative. Oh, that's like red wine gums. Oh, with nice one. this shot of espresso right behind it. Ooh, that, that is a good. big transition yeah. from fruit to coffee. Yeah. Big transition. <sighs> Not a shocking yeah. one, though, right? It's, it's like. No, a, no, yeah, just, yeah, yeah. just, uh, Ooh. Oh, and it's coffee all the way to the finish as well. Yeah. Yep. Not not huge wood on it, to be honest. Not astringent in the slightest. Now, I say this as somebody who's had a couple of the 65.1% light whiskeys for the Jubilee. Yeah. I've actually gone on and poured a, and then a second um, mystery whiskey mm. here. And now I'm tasting our Dal Ewan. So as much as we talk about context, when we write the notes for that at 8 a.m. on a weekday morning, it might be doing something else on that day. Mm. But right now, oh, that's exactly what I would happily transition to right now. Drink a lot of. Oh, can I say this very quickly? Yeah. yeah. I, I was. You were going to mention Seabass. You mentioned that name earlier. Um, I was going to mention Ben Weldy. Um, dear, dear Ben Weldy oh, yeah, over in sure. Texas. I was talking to him the other day and he said, I did what you're always talking about uh, with a whiskey. I pulled the cork, in this case a vino seal, mm -hmm. on the Friday and I recycled the bottle on a Monday. Oh, God um, bless him. He had been imbibing with friends over the course of the weekend. <laughs> it wasn't a solo uh -huh, uh, journey uh -huh. here. But our Wolf Island bottling that was uh, oh, in U.S. Yeah, retail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he 
loved it. Absolutely loved it. And so he just jumped into my mind there. A, I wanted to mention his name in today's episode, but in tasting this Dal Ewan, I'm thinking, you could pull that cork on a Friday and recycle the bottle on a Monday. Uh-huh. That would be a good weekend. Yeah, 55.4, exactly. you, could, you could treat yourself. Completely. Completely. <laughs> So, so let's let's go on. So n- now we're yes. into the world of world yes. whiskeys, right? So we, here are the four other bottlings that we're doing. So we've got another M and H coming your way, and this is a three only one. Year old. What's that? Only one. Uh, well, I'm not done. At first, when I first <laughs> one? When, when you first said that, I thought you said no, we don't. <laughs> It's like, wait a second, am I looking at the wrong labels? <laughs> As opposed to, there can be only one. <laughs> there can be only one. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah, so we, we have a three-year-old that was matured three years in an ex isla cask, followed by another three-year-old that is simply from a first fill bourbon barrel. Both of them just remarkable, remarkable whiskeys. The ex bourbon barrel, first fill again. Uh, 58.9% alcohol, and the ex isla cask is 59.2%. And then... I gonna f- just want to th- yeah. throw in real quickly on yeah. the M&H. The ex isla cask yeah. is a real teeny tiny outturn. 120 bottles. 120 real bottles. Real yeah, teeny was tiny. tiny on that one. So... Hmm. That'll be that'll be online as you as you correctly yeah. say, but I don't think it's gonna hang around for long. The good news is the first fill bourbon is is straight up excellent spirit and and I think represents what they're doing at MH incredibly well. Very, very proud of that one. There there have been people champing at the bit for more M&H, and, and here it is. And, and actually, we've even selected yet another M&H cask that will be for next year as well, and that one is a funky monkey, to say the least, but delicious. So I'm going to go to Can a... Can we say selected by Jess at the distillery? Did she reselect the one that we selected, or did she let select a second one? Because then we have two. She selected the beer. <sighs> That's right. So we've got an X beer <laughs> cask from M and H, and then an X Israeli white wine cask, which both just remarkable. Oh, that's that's great. Thank you for that's a good reminder. We're gonna go to another country now, Jason, and this is from a distillery in a country that we've never bottled from before. This is a 13-year-old from the MacMira distillery out of Sweden. The mm-hmm. whiskey spent all 13 years in a virgin oak hogshead. 250 bottles, 47.4% alcohol. And that's, I mean, we're, we're bottling cask strength whiskeys, right? Think about Sweden yeah. and, and the cold there, right? You, you're, I don't know if they fill their casks at a different ABV. Uh, but but of the cast samples we've tasted from MacMira, they've all been this sort of upper 40s, very low 50s. They have a very interesting maturation where they're actually using an X mining shaft. Oh, and yeah. so they're they're maturing underground. And they're this it absolutely boggles my mind. They're losing almost no volume, but they are losing strength. Yeah. And it's <laughs> just like I've asked that question multiple times. I've followed up my research on that question multiple times. We were told this when we were discussing a cask with them, and we didn't believe it. And then we got <laughs> the regage numbers and when you see it written down in black and white, yes, this has lost alcohol since the time it went in the cask. No, it hasn't lost volume. It How? Is it a magic trick happening in Sweden? But to add on as well, that virgin oak that we're talking about there, mm-hmm. you and I and, I, and I think it happened around the same time. You can speak up if I'm putting words in your mouth. But Glenn Murray... 
and virgin oak was the first time it really hit my radar that virgin oak could do some really magical things to, to with, single malt to with single malt right right yeah same, it's, okay that that same. doesn't just have to be an american maturation uh technique right that can work for single malt yeah i mean you bring up a really good point glenn murray is a distillery that had been championing virgin oak for years and years and years, you know, I have two bottles of the Mountain Oak. They're 16-year-old Mountain Oak. Actually, looking at my bottle now, or one of my bottles now, this was distilled in 91. So 31 years ago, they put this spirit into New Chard Oak. So I think your point's a valid one. If, if anybody's been doing it with any openness or regularity, it will have been Glenn Murray. They're the first people that come to mind for me as well. Yeah, good. I'm glad we I'm glad we have kind of a similar intro to that. And I know it doesn't always work, but anytime we show up at Glen Murray, we're always asking for some virgin oak casks. And so far they haven't been forthcoming, but maybe one of these days. And in the meantime, I'm really excited to take our first foray into Swedish single malt mm. with someone as renowned as Macmira and a, a spirit that absolutely delicious. Really. I'm really excited to share it. We we said that back in the day with with bringing some of these new distilleries to people. Yeah, and uh, and I feel that way. I feel that way about everything on the list. So Dal Ewan, I feel like we're champion Dal Ewan for heaven's sakes. And I think that we should champion Dal Ewan. But let let me let me do this because I I would argue that there's a good chance a lot of our listeners, especially if they're based in the U.S will not have had a lot of experience with the with the MacMira distillery. MacMira came into the US for a little bit. They had a 1 liter bottling of you know, a non-age stated whiskey, but it never really went too far beyond that. So I want to share our tasting notes with people. Mm. Mm-hmm. And so uh, color on this bright copper. And on the nose we're getting sweet malted barley, which is both warm and inviting. And then I love this. It says and these, these are definitely your tasting notes. They say, note how it's enveloped by the warm Manuka honey and aromas from a summer meadow, mm. while ripe honeydew melon and just a hint of sea salt live at the edges of the experience. And then the, the palate, wonderfully unctuous texture that delivers baking spice, toasted sesame seeds, and a pleasing earthiness with ground gray pepper and more Manuka honey. Mm. In the time, sorry, in time, the experience gets a little nutty with raw cashews appearing toward the rear of the palate. And then finally, your finish, moderate to long with baking spice, ground gray pepper, and lingering cashew notes. I love that that cashew note is really being carried from, from the palate to the finish. It's not going too far away. And that you've got that sea salt on the nose. Yeah. It just, it sounds really nice and inviting. But also hearing that there's a sweetness there, but it's an an earthier sweetness, a heavier sweetness. And then hearing the wood notes come through uh, from that virgin oak, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's going to be a great one to share. Looking forward to getting ahead of that one. Yeah. And then finally, we have what will be our second Paul John bottling now we've done a paul john before it's a four-year-old it was for rest of the world so never came into the u.s our friends in the uk and europe and israel got to enjoy it Uh, but that one the four-year-old was an unpeated whiskey and the five-year-old we're bringing into the u.s is a peated offering first fill bourbon 56.7 percent alcohol only 160 bottles and uh, did you want me to read the tasting notes on that one? Yeah, go on. I, I, I remember uh, a key note to it, and so I'm hoping it made it into our, mm-hmm. our final version. So color. You ready for this? I love this color. And this is a color note that, are, that I chose, I think. Fresh motor oil. <laughs> I like that. Anyway, so fresh motor oil knows the P 
Pete leads the way with notes of backyard campfires, freshly cleaned swimming pools, and even clean, clean hospital bandages. That's all you, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> you love your hospital bandages. I uh, do. <laughs> but there's also a brightness with tropical fruit, vanilla custard, and semolina pudding. Now, the semolina mm. pudding is your note. Can you describe what semolina pudding is real quickly? Oh, gosh, that's one of those ones. Hard to put words to it. I remember when I was in primary school, we would actually have to walk um, along the road to go get our uh, school lunch. And sometimes they would have semolina pudding. Um, it, some of the kids really hated it, and I always really loved it and looked forward to it. But it's it's kind of like a sweet and heavy cereal note hmm. that can be so incredibly pleasing. I will also say I do feel the same way about rice pudding. And uh, whenever I mention rice pudding to Jess, who obviously grew up in the UK just like I did, she makes a face over rice pudding oh, every rice time pudding. I mention it. Um, and so I don't know if semolina pudding is going to, to split people the way it did my primary school classmates, but... Yeah. It's just grain. It's just another presentation of grain that I think can be very warming and very satisfying. Is it sweet though, or or is it more like a little a, sweet? Uh, yeah, a little sweet. Is it like cream of wheat? Would you compare it mm -hmm, to a cream mm -hmm, of mm -hmm, wheat then? Mm -hmm. okay. Absolutely, yes, absolutely. Okay, would you? Where's the sweetness then coming from? Is it a grain-driven sweetness, or is it like a a brown sugar added to the? To that. I'm sh I'm sure the school dinner ladies were just pumping in a whole bunch of white sugar just to make it sweet. <laughs> I, I don't think they'd earned their Michelin stars at that point. <laughs> we are talking the 1980s here, Joshua. Yeah, it was flat in tires Scotland. the whole way. Uh, all right, so the palate says mouth coating with sweet grain, gentle oak spice, quince jam. I love that quince jam. Barbecued pineapples, peanut skins, and a hint more vanilla custard. And then the finish, yeah. Just before you go on, as soon as I hear peanut skins going up against quince jam, quince jelly, like you know you've got spirit, you've got yeast uh, going up against the peated component in there, yeah. going with the cask. Like those two notes are really like the symbols in a in an orchestra like there's a whole bunch of things coming together on that yeah well i mean in in the fact of the matter is you've you've got a few to choose from right you've got your your peanut skins your pudding skins your your melon <laughs> skins you know and then you've got sort of your your fruit skins there's really four skins to choose from Painful, painful. And I could see that coming from a hundred <laughs> miles away. Hundred miles away. As soon as you started using your thumb. <laughs> hey, at least I start with my thumb. Anyway, and the finish. What's weird is it's got no nail on it. I'm not doing cocaine off my thumb. What do you, why do people have the long thumbnails? I think it's either for strumming guitars or doing large amounts of cocaine all at once. There wasn't a religious professional didn't remove the nail from your thumb? I don't even know what that means. Oh, now I get it. I Moving get on. it because it got the, yeah, okay. Finish. Wow, that, talk about tortured. That that was just terrible. That wasn't even tortured. It was just terrible. Finish. Pleasantly Please do. What? <laughs> Pleasantly drying with rhubarb and custard hard candies and more mm. oak spice while the barbecued pineapple lingers in the background. And, and as I finish reading these notes... I realize the fresh motor oil must have been yours because these are all, these scream of your tasting notes. So you must have written the, the motor oil. I did learn fresh motor oil from uh, James Foster many a moon ago oh, in the okay. society, but it is something we've, we've each taken turns using. So yeah. I think the door is open as to who uh, created that one. But those barbecue pineapple notes... Oh. I'm almost certain the quince, quince jam or quince jelly would have been you. That's yeah, that's, you that's a good through. point. I'm, I'm a Peanut quince. skins does tend to be me, to be honest. Yep. You like your skins. I like right. my skin on. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I didn't have a choice in the matter. Eight days in, they're like, you're done. 
Um, You're like, but I like peanuts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Please don't give peanuts to a child under three. So those are our single cast nation online offerings for the U.S. Again, yes. again, coming. Am I missing one, Jason? Well, I was in my mind. I was holding on to the cask picks for retail, and so I was going to transition to that. So I, I find that I find the the two very different, right? We have our single cast nation offerings that are online exclusives only, and then we've started working with some more retailers, uh, selling them their own casks of single cast nation. Now, Jason, you have the list in front of you, so I hope you could go over that for the listener. We do. We have a 15-year-old first fill bourbon Macduff that is going to 99 bottles in Connecticut. Mm. Connecticut is such a great state. That's a cask we've owned for almost as long as we've had a company. So true. there's there's a good little bit of company history going off with that one, mm-hmm. and I'm I'm really excited to have that go off to 99 bottles. They've been a a really tremendous supporter of ours. Yep. Speaking of tremendous supporters, we have our very own Bikram from Norfolk Wine and Spirits mm-hmm. selecting an 11 year old refill hoggy of Kalila, oh, and. Gosh. And I hope I don't think I'm speaking out of school here, but Bikram and I are both tremendous. F- <laughs> I don't know how I get a D on the end of that. Both tremendous fans of Le Chig. Oh and yes. And when we bottle Le Chig as single cast nation, we make sure we've got plenty for Bikram. When Bikram bottles Le Chig for Norfolk Wine and Spirits. I like to make sure he's got some to the side for me. Mm-hmm. And so to, to have him get a Kalila and, and run with a Kalila here, I think is going to be a really successful choice. Uh, really, really happy with that one and that partnership, that collaboration. Uh, we then have four rums coming in. Amazing. Single cask rums that I'm not going to add too many details to right now. But the fact that we're bottling single cask rums, especially what you said earlier that came from Mitch via the friend of his about the rums that that tend to fit our palate uh, and that we have in turn put in front of some retailers here, those are going to be worth searching out. Whether you're a whiskey person, especially if you're a rum person, I think those are going to be home runs as well. So... Um, so that's what that's what we've got. So that's actually going to be seven casks in total uh, coming across the pond for retailers over here. Yeah. In a future episode, we'll talk about some of the things we're doing in country for retailers over here as well. But to be clear, this is the cask pick program. This is Elijah's baby. This is what Elijah works on diligently behind mm-hmm. the scenes. Mm-hmm. And these retailers are here through Elijah. And so I'm excited to see this build. I know, and you know, Joshua, (laughs) we have retailers day in and day out asking when they get their cask. And I know Elijah's keeping a lot of plates in the air right now to, to please as many people as possible, which you and I know is not easy. It's it's because everyone's excited right? and everyone's passionate, right? And, and I'll just add on to this, you know, we're, we're not the only company that has a single cast program that is limited, right? There, there are distilleries, I don't want to mention an, a name, but I'll, it's a distillery that, that I work with. And, you know, we went from having a, a large single cast program down to being truncated to a handful of casks for the year. And it's yeah. simply because... Yeah. Single yep. bottling single casks is not the easiest proposition in the world, and and at all times we have to look out for our own standard offerings, and then we can see where we can fill in other holes and help some of our our partners out who have been supporting us. You know, we always want to do that. It's just there are only so many casks, 
and we want to get as many people into it as possible, not just retailers, but clubs as well, right? There, there's certain 100%. whiskey clubs 100%. that we work with, and and we don't have to go through the list here, but we, we bottled some single casts for clubs that we're bringing in uh, on this shipment as well. Yeah, I, I feel like we could get a T-shirt made for Elijah that says there's only so many casks, uh, <laughs> because I know he's saying that multiple times a day. Yeah. Uh, and actually, just, just to close out this little piece here, and even looking farther afield in the United States, is our Canadian importer, PWS, selected a single cask rum that's mm. going to come mm-hmm. in um, with their allocation from ROW, rest of the world, retail release number three. Yeah. Uh, they've yeah. been sitting on their allocation there, and now there's a single cask rum to go out with that as well. And that was on Jess and Elijah making that happen for Canada. Mm-hmm. And so the, we're thinking about all the markets at all the times. There's only so many casks. There's only so much bottling you can get done. There's only so many labels. We said that at the start of today's episode. Mm-hmm. There's only so many labels you can get pushed through. Whew. You, you ever wondered where the where the expression bottleneck comes from? Because <laughs> <laughs> we live it day in yeah. and day out. Yeah, bottleneck pour. Um, <laughs> so. Bottleneck pour. I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> But that's that's a lot of whiskey floating around. It's a lot of rum. It's a lot of world whiskey. It's it's a good amount of scotch coming in as well. Uh, and we're not done. There are still projects happening in the United States and in Scotland behind these as well. Yeah. Um, it it just it keeps turning over. And I think that alludes to what you were saying earlier in the in the episode. Is there's not really a quiet period. There's not really a down period. But if there was to be a, a month that's quieter than the other 11, uh, this is currently it, but by no means is it silent. Yeah. It's, yep. it's why it's only an afternoon nap and it's not going to bed in the afternoon <laughs> and waking up the following morning. So I know we want to close out here. We, we've talked news. We've, we've brought in emails. There is a, a an Apple review that I want to bring in before mm. we get out of here. But before we get to that, I want to play one last game of what's in my glass with you because I've poured something okay. new. Okay, this is the truncated version. This is the yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. twenty questions. Uh, yeah. Give me give me an outline of it, and then I can start asking twenty questions. Uh, so. All right. So what you're saying is give give you a few hints. Yeah, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Right. So this is not a single cast nation bottling. Okay. Neither is mine. This is this bottling did not come to the US. However, they do have distribution within the US. This was a UK exclusive. And <laughs> it's a Scottish whiskey. Okay. Is it from Single Malts of Scotland? It's not an independently bottled whiskey. Oh, gosh. I don't know any other kinds. (laughs) (laughs) Neither is mine. (laughs) Now, I haven't told you this, but I told someone who works at the distillery this. Actually, I think I may have told you this before, but we we both may have had a couple drinks in us. But this distillery... So no different from right this very second, then. This distillery has made it into my top five distilleries of all time. I just am loving everything that they're doing, and I'm not ashamed to to scream loud and proud about it. So look at the color. You got that? Yeah, yeah. Is it bourbon maturation? A little bit of bourbon, a little bit of sherry. Uh, <laughs> They don't have distribution in America, and mm. this is a UK That's bottling. That's not what I said, and guy who d- only listens five. to partially. Uh, yeah, I, I said because I'm trying to think of of whiskey. This yeah. this bottling was a UK only bottling. However, but, they do have distribution within the US. If if you are talking about a top five all time, and this isn't Kilhoman, I'm going to get in a car. Well, I probably shouldn't get in a car. I will get in a train right now, and I will come to Connecticut, and I will beat your head in. So it's not Kilhoman. I like where you're going, 
without this being Isla. So okay. it's not Isla, but there is a youthfulness to this whiskey. And did you say it is scotch? It's scotch whiskey. And there is a peaty element to it. I'd call it medium peated. <laughs> and they have American distribution and it's an OB, but this is from the UK. Mm-hmm. This could be literally anything, anything. You have been to the distillery yourself. I have never been there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. I like that a lot. Uh-huh. Okay. Wow. Daft Mill? Uh, it's not Daft Mill. Okay. Does Daft Mill have peated spirit? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I have a bottle of Daft Mill that, um, that Michael Nolan had gotten for me, but uh, I haven't opened it yet. I'm just trying to think of distilleries I've been to without you, and it's it's a very small number, and it's not so easy to think about. And every time I think, oh, that, no, no, because we went back there together. Okay, yeah. I might have gone to it first by myself, but I've, we've always made a point to then revisit it. Where have you not been in Scotland that I've been? And that would enter into your top five distilleries. This is the part that's thrown me the most from this reveal, is that this is in your top five. I think once I tell you who it is, you'll understand why it's in my top five. (laughs) Okay, this is the last thing that I'll say about it, the last sort of hint that I'll say Uh about it. I think what this distillery is doing now, Highland Park was doing in the 2000s and 2000, earlier 2010s, even the, even the late 90s, where they were presenting a whiskey that was the perfect all-rounder, right? It ticked all the boxes. A little peaty, a little sweet, a little spicy, a little nutty. Right? It was all the things to all the people. Arden American? Arden American. Bam. <laughs> You nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, so this Arden is Arden their... Merkin's in your top five. Who did you oh. push out of your top five to put Arden Merkin in it? I don't remember who I pushed out of my top five, but they remain Lagavulin, Kilhoman, Springbank, Imperial... And now Arden Merkin. I'm trying to think who who I pushed out. I did push. What I out. love about this, what am I? What I love about this is I know there are listeners out there who have indexed every episode, and they know your top five better C-Bass. than you do. Sea bass, <laughs> and they know exactly who you've pushed out. There's been an episode where you've said this distillery is now in my top five, and today they're not. Ah, oh, brilliant! I love our listeners. <laughs> All right, so. So that's what's in my glass. Are, are you doing one as well? Or you're like, yeah. Ah. Yeah, okay, what do you got? No, no, go fast. Go fast. I'm, I'm, I'm almost to the end of my pour of it, so, so I could quite happily pour a little bit more. And, and, uh, really quickly. Yeah. I had a tough time saying that, simply because Impex imports Arden American. But it's just so spectacular. Their spirit is remarkable stuff and and I'm well just... I'm, I'm gonna say there's there's literally not one Arden American in my house <gasps> oh my gosh I have 20 CL of their new make from 2014 well we need to remedy that <laughs> quickly if I had a bottle for every time you've said you'll get me a bottle I would have so many more bottles than I currently have, and I have too many. All right, go for it, my man. Yep. All right, so so you've poured something uh, in your glass. Can I see the color? It's it's bull. It, it it's funny. It's looking much darker on the video than it is in my hand. It it's much more huh. blonde with some highlights, some reddish gold highlights. Yeah, it almost if 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 you were to tell me. This is a a 20-year-old whiskey from Firstville Bourbon Cask, I'd believe you. Ah, okay, that's a good way to think about it. There there are some clues I can give you that will (laughs) tell you why it's the color it is, but move on. Okay, so it's a deeper color. Is it scotch whiskey or other? 
It is. <laughs> 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 so when you scotch. come to a fork in the road, Joshua, take it. Take it. it. <laughs> okay, yeah, so it is. It's a scotch. It's it is a scotch, scotch. whiskey. Okay. Is it uh, peated or unpeated? It is very beautifully peated. Beautifully peated. Okay. Uh, is it cask strength? <laughs> See, now we're really giving the game away. But given that this is the truncated version, yes, it is. Yes, it is cask strength. Yeah, I've, 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 I feel as if I know what it is. All right. Is it a South Shore Isla distillery? <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting on IB or OB. Uh, you can keep waiting. Is it a South Shore Isla <laughs> distillery? <laughs> <laughs> it, it is. It is. And there, there might be a reason that this is in my glass this episode. And right, and so this is me <laughs> using I, some, some context clues. It's <laughs> cask strength. It's South Shore Isla. Okay, is it an IB or an OB? This is most definitely an OB that should be on every shelf. Okay, so for those listeners that don't know the difference, IB, independently bottled whiskey, OB, owner's bottling or original bottling or whatever. <laughs> oh, then then it's easy. If, if you say it should be on everybody's shelf <laughs> and it's cask strength. And because I know that there's not necessarily a Bowmore that you feel should be on everybody's shelf. There is not. There is not. And Bowmore's also oh, and not Bowmore's South not South Shore, right? So, yeah, I'm sorry. So so we're looking at Lafroy, Gardbeg, or Lagavulin. And, and so I have Lagavulin. an art bag that... There is an art bag. If you're going to have an art bag, there is an art bag that should be on every shelf. But I oh. think as the South Shore goes, I think I would have the other two on my shelf before I had the the art bag on my shelf. I am in a fortunate position. I have all three of them on my shelf. But so I'm going to say it's it's not art bag. It's not art bag. So it's either Lafroig or Lagavulin. <laughs> and given the context clues, I'm going to say this is Lafroig ten year old cask strength. Ride those context clues all the way to the right answer. Yeah, this is batch 11. Yeah, batch 11. Okay. And so why <sighs> should it be on everybody's shelf? It's doing what Lefroig should do. And here's the thing that I, that I enjoy. So I'm, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a Lefroig 10 original cask strength originalist, which is I liked it in the green tube with the red band on it oh, yeah. for the yeah, original yeah, yeah. cast strength. Yep. And they they just simply tried to keep that consistent. And then they got to the day where they said, tell you what, what if we did batches for the original cast strength? Mm-hmm. And I love the fact that as whiskey nerds, we can battle over better and worse batches mm. of original cast strength, 10 Lefroig. And... And I know there were some single digits that were not the best Lefroy could be. And I've heard of some low double digits that have been better versions of Lefroy mm. 10 Castrin. Okay. And so so this this batch of living is actually from March of 2019. It's from the before times. And I mm. I think it represents Lefroy well. It's not the best Lefroy I've ever had. It's not um, I was almost going to pull a Joshua statement there, which was to say it's not even the best batch I've had, but I'm not playing that game. I'm not going to give you the name of the best batch <laughs> that I've had. Damn so, it. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I, think it's just, I think it's just really good. And back in the old days when I was but a boy, you could get it for $45 a bottle and now it's $85, $90 a I bottle. remember those days. Right. I, I still, 90, that's a good price. And that, that's what I was going to say. I, I still think it delivers a good bang for the buck. Mm-hmm. There was also a time, and I'm not as confident in the statement anymore. I know there was a time when it was true that the Lefroy 10 cask strength was a distillery only and US only exclusive. I rem- yeah, I, yes, I remember that. Someone at Lefroy had told us that. It was Vicky, Vicky, was Vicky. Uh, managing the visitor yeah. center there. there you go. Back, and again, yeah. back when she was managing the visitor yeah. center there. Um, and so it was amazing, right? If you came in from any other market and you visited the distillery, you could take home the original cask strength. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that was unique to where you lived. And for us coming in from America, it was like, 
Um, that's in my local liquor yeah, store. What else you got? <laughs> <laughs> You're right. And it was always both wonderful because it was great knowing you could just go to the liquor store and pick it up. And both disappointing because it wasn't something special you could pick up at the distillery. Um, and so it's, yeah, it's always at a special place in my heart. Covering Sean's email today, talking about Lefroig, talking about the positioning of Select. I just had to go ahead and pour this. And so this has been yeah. really tasty. I think that well, was maybe too many words, but I enjoyed mm-hmm. them all. And I hope our listeners did too. Well, well done. Um hmm. Yeah, especially Sean, and, and hopefully Sean's uh, sister's boyfriend will have, will have heard you talk about it. I, tell, I can't wait for him to email us info at singlecastnation.com or questions at one nation under whiskey.com, no ease, and, um, and have him give his side of that Christmas morning. Well, I, gosh, now I feel, I feel, I really feel as if we've been shitting on him too much. Maybe he deserves it, maybe he doesn't. He could be a. No, there's there's good people on both sides, Jason. He, absolutely, yeah, yeah. I think there's both sides to to every story. Yeah. So I want to close out with this, and and you know, really quickly, Sean, thank you for emailing in. James, thank you as always for for emailing in. He also sent in a potential story for an extra extra. And so, if if anybody else wants to reach out to us, you can reach out to us. The way James did, questions at one nation under whiskey.com, or you could reach out to us the way Sean did, info at singlecastnation.com. And then if you're like Trevor W or AKA Clutch1975, who wrote a review on Apple Podcast, Jason, on your birthday, June twenty seventh. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. You can you can do that. You can write a review on Apple Podcasts. And so this one is simply entitled One Nation Under Whiskey. And it's got five stars. Does and, exactly what it says on the tin. Yeah, exactly. And Trevor W. says, I started following the, the podcast after doing a swap with a friend who had the wonderful Port Charlotte bottling, but found <laughs> it too peaty. Oh, that's a good friend to have. No, I agree with you. You you shouldn't make yourself like it. I could quite happily take it off your hands. <laughs> the podcast hits all the notes I'm looking for. Serious, yet not taking it too serious, and informative. The humor displayed on the podcast is similar, and I find myself sharing the link with friends. If you want an insider's perspective into the whiskey industry... And to be entertained, listen to this podcast. There you go. That's really brilliant. Really, really brilliant. It's it, it's interesting to to me because I know you, you do a better job than I do of yeah, of thinking about people who you do a better job than I do. <laughs> period. It's a shame you're you're in charge of post production as well. So <laughs> who knows where this <laughs> statement finishes, but. You know, you're forever saying, hey, and for those, IB means this, and OB means this, mm-hmm. and ABV means this, and, and what Jason's NAS, giving yeah. you the shortcut version of here means this, blah, blah, blah. To Sean's point about don't forget to drop a little tip along the way for the novice, I would say to our listeners, the best way for us to remain true to that is drop us an email, ask us a question, give us a dedicated opportunity to say okay today we're gonna revisit right Mm. because for you and I it's going into the past and the distant past to say here's when we were first starting out we it's easy to forget what it was like first starting out good point and so drop us a note right just just send us an email you've got two addresses you can use and it gives us a chance to put on the brakes and say, oh, brilliant. Person X has asked this question. I'm sure this will benefit even more people who listen mm-hmm. to the to the pad cost. So, um, so I wanted to get that in, but that, that's a great review. And I'm just glad people think it's worth their time because we're not hesitant about piling up the minutes. And I'm very honest about it where I just love sitting here gabbing away to you. And today has been wonderfully indulgent it's been much needed uh if much, I'm, I'm, being very I'm i'm feeling a wee bit tipsy which i think feels right. absolutely wonderful all right that's not so bad i've hit 
I've hit them a wee bit hard in, uh, in talking to you with a few hat and pores under here. Before we get out of here, and I know that that last comment was getting us out of here, but getting us out of here, <laughs> Elijah has revisited something that you posited in uh, a not too distant episode uh, that's true. about the cocktail world. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm just going to, there's a text, I'm just going to read it just like you read that review. And it'll be done and dusted. And Elijah says, recommendation after some tests, which Ooh. you have my attention. Yeah. Like you've you've done the work. You have my attention. Yeah. You tested positive. It sounds yeah. as I'm guessing. <laughs> like, <laughs> what? Did I say something? Pre COVID, that used to mean something very, very different. And now <laughs> post COVID, we're just like, oh, point. we throw around positive tests all the time now. Yeah. And nobody worries about it. Um this this was reverting back to your mention of the daiquiri. And you mentioned, Mitch, at the top of today's episode, we're going to get out of here in the rum world. Mm. So if you're looking for uh, a little daiquiri recipe here, Elijah recommends one and three quarter ounces of our SCN Bean Lee rum, mm. which packs a wee punch. So... <laughs> That's going to be a cocktail that gets you where so. you're going. It's 65.1%, <laughs> I think. Yeah, it's up yeah. there. 65 one certainly matches the light whiskey that I was yeah, drinking earlier. Yep. So are we in the same wheelhouse? Yep. So one and three quarter ounces of the Beanley, three quarter ounce of Demerara or simple syrup. He puts in parentheses, homemade, good lad. <laughs> and one ounce of fresh lime juice. Shake with ice and double strain, parentheses, always. Mm. And serve in a coupe or similar glass. I've got an issue with the double straining. I I like a single strained daiquiri because I like a little bit of those ice chunks just floating about. I think it's visually pleasing. Uh, But it's interesting, his ratio is there. So usually... My ratio for a daiquiri is two ounces of a rum. Insert rum here. I usually do black top, but um, I haven't done our our, uh, our beanly, so I've got to give that a go. So it's two ounces of a rum, an ounce of lime, and then three quarters ounce simple syrup. And so he's doing one and three quarter ounce rum with an ounce lime. Is that what he's saying? So he he likes his a little limeier. But then again, I normally do the black top that's at 46 something. Exactly. And the Beanley is at 65 one. So I guess that exactly. ratio makes sense. There you go. I certainly thought so, yeah. So there you go. If if you're sitting at home, you have the Beanley, you have an uncut lime, and you know how to boil equal parts water and sugar, you too could be having a daiquiri this evening. There you go. Oh, Maybe I this like afternoon. That. Yeah, do it this afternoon, right? Given what we said early in the episode, maybe this morning. Give a little you time, right? Maybe your you're partner a, wants a daiquiri. Pour him you're or among her daiquiri. friends. Yeah, yeah. You're among friends. Yeah. Breakfast daiquiris. Get it in you. What doesn't scream July like breakfast daiquiris? Get it in you. All right, listeners, thank you again. Uh, Jason, as always, thank you. Thank you to you. Pleasure, Joshua. This was Uh, a blast. Absolute blast. This is the stuff that dreams are made of. Indeed. So, and and we've said it before, we'll say it again. Always to the listeners, of course, to Sean, of course, to James Foster. Um, We will be returning with some guests, but we wanted to just take a break and have a little little us time. So hopefully that was time. It was as good for you as it was for us. 